Someone tell me when that comes up and I'll put my password in. Be nice. Yeah. <laughs> so this talk's mostly about what makes a viable video, digital audio platform and how Linux and OSS software achieves it. Um, I use Linux to compose and record music at home on a studio. And um, one of the difficulties I had when I started doing this work was working out how the sound system on Linux worked and the learning curve of the applications that came with it. The, um, I suppose perversely that's also what kept me interested in the subject and, and made it more rewarding for my sense. Yeah, yeah. Do you keep it on? Yeah, keep it on. Good. Nice. So the suitability of Linux as a platform, platform for audio production uh, came together with the amalgamation of the real-time kernel and development of several key applications for recording and mastering sound. So I'm going to focus on the developments in the real-time kernel today and later I'll go over some examples in the tutorial about uh, what we can do with Linux. So the real-time kernel is a generic name for a series of patches and settings that enable applications that must replicate the response time of the real world. Excuse me for reading, this is why I had the screenshots so you didn't have to look at me read. Uh, an example with the sound is when you plug in an electric guitar into your computer and you need to hear the sound coming through the speakers at the same time as your ears hear the strings thrumming. It's not the same as when you plug into an amplifier where the analog signals converted into electrical impulses which flow through the wires and circuitry to the speaker. In the case of the computer, you're doing an analog to digital conversion and the sound card and then the CPU and the operating system redirecting that digital stream and reconverting the digitized concept of the sound back into the electrical impulses and sending it to the speakers. The question for me when I started was why do I need a real-time kernel to do this when I play sound on my computer and my laptop, most of my applications, they just work fine. So, uh, but this is different from using the PC for live performances and uh, for recording. So the traditional normal generic release of the 2.6 Linux kernel is designed for overall throughput of multi-user applications. It has an emphasis on fairness amongst the application processes sharing the resources it's a wonderful and robust, flexible arrangement, much loved, but it's misaligned with the requirements of the real-time audio, which I'll go over soon. <laughs> I'm just going to reboot that again while I play. Real-time operating systems have been around since the late 80s. They are a requirement for embedded applications and control systems, such as those used by the military, life financial trading systems, medical applications for imaging, life support and audio telecommunications and multimedia production. It wasn't until 2004-2005 <coughs> that uh, it was fully realised on Linux. There had been attempts beforehand. They weren't completely successful. There's emerging of the code from an embedded Linux vendor with a series of patches from Red Hat developers, among many others, to provide these capabilities to the standard Linux kernel. The real-time patches and settings are about making things more dependable and more predictable for application designers to support the main functions of audio production, mixing, recording, editing, and mastering. The prerequisite is that the operating system delivers a consistent and stable platform for sound. It's best illustrated with an example. The example is to capture a sound, like a note from a tuning fork, and play it back with a visual representation of the wave. The sound emanating from the vibrating steel in the air takes the form of an alternating pressure deviation from the equilibrium of the medium. It causes regions of compression and rarefaction, and these vibrate the cone of the microphone in the same frequencies. The vibrations can be mapped into lines on a graph, it's something we can work with digitally, and uh, the codec converts the analog longitudinal or compressional waves into a digital waveform. The sound card buffer holds this information in easily digestible packets, and the kernel, the sound card driver modules, and OS libraries all play in the CPU. A PCI interface connects the card to the motherboard, and input and output connects for the microphone, 
and speakers are controlled with hardware interrupts and signals. The sound card doesn't have its own digital signal processor like on an old laptop, then it will claim ticks from the CPU. The sound can then pass from the application that's capturing all of this information and rendering it on the screen as a nice series of amplitude values plotted over time. Lastly, the sound is reflected back to the listener through the speakers. So the sound needs to be captured, converted, rendered and reproduced in the same time, mostly, as it takes for the real sound to travel into the ear for the brain to hear it. If there's a lag in the sound system, then the ear will detect it and the user will experience an echo or drop out of the audio signal, which would generally be bad. So the first requirement for working with audio is low latency between the system components or the ability to keep up with the real world. Generically, these dropouts and lags are called X runs and they typically, typically occur when the system CPU is too busy to either refresh the input or output audio buffers in time to keep up with the sound card. But they could also come from latency from the hardware and interrupt handlers in the driver and the application design. Seems like quite a lot, but basic PC hardware is mostly able to handle it without too many problems. That said, there may still be a need to tune some hardware to minimise latency from certain interrupts. Historically, the traditional architecture of the Unix kernel is not really designed for this type of workload, and in this case, its design can inhibit the integrity of the audio system or any real time application for that matter. If someone wants to come up and pull the battery out of that laptop and restart it for me, that'll probably come up because I've had this problem a few times before. Um, mind you, this is the laptop's fault, not Linux. So as I mentioned, Linux multi-user time-sharing kernel is excellent at handling and prioritizing many concurrent processes, and it does this by allocating time in the CPU according to a scheduler and a priority system, which is tuned for fairness among the processes and overall throughput. It aims to reduce context switching, How's that? Hello? How's that? That's not my left. <laughs> Can you hear anything? Do -do -do -do. I swear I didn't touch it. Microphone down, everyone can hear me okay? In case it picks up. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, we talked about why Linux doesn't support real time audio. Now, we'll look at the ways in which the traditional kernel does handle audio in real time and why it needs to be patched to get over the problems that it incurs. Um, and there's five things to look at. There's the way processes preempt one another for the CPU resources. Uh, there's the scheduling of processes. There's um, memory allocation and paging, interrupt handlers, and timing. First of all, we'll look at the scheduler. When an application is run, it creates a new process. We'll usually fork off synchronous or concurrent casts in separate processes as required. Conceptually, threads run within processes and have a similar ability at a smaller scale to split off within processes and run separate tasks synchronously. Uh, the allocation of time in the CPU for all processes, but not all events, on the host is prioritised by the scheduler. 
The scheduler can only run at certain intervals and events like interrupts and critical kernel code have priority over the scheduler. So to get CPU time, your process has to wait for the interrupts in the kernel code to return before the scheduler can allocate it the CPU. Sometimes the kernel needs to do a comparative lengthy task which is not broken up by scheduler runs. And if your scheduler doesn't run, then your task doesn't get allocated the CPU and uh, the sound cards in your, the buffers inside your sound card might empty out and you'll get an X run. Um, the other problem we can have with the CPU is with locks and the preemption priority. The design of the kernel is so that code runs safely on symmetric multiprocessing systems where the CPU is constantly switching between tasks. Individual competing threads and processes of the application code are allocated time in the CPU and interrupted when their time is up or a process with a high priority taps it on the shoulder. The kernel itself arbitrates this and each time its scheduler is run it checks for tasks that are ready and finds the one that has the highest priority and gives it the processor. In order for this to work, and it works extremely well in most cases, critical application data or code is protected with locks. A spin lock waits, or spins, until the process that's holding the CPU to run a critical section is free. When the lock is released, the waiting process can then grab the lock and continue to work. So this is one mechanism through which the processors may hold lock on the CPU for long enough to starve the audio application of resources. Similarly, threads use mutexes, mutual exclusion locks, and semaphores to control resourcing and program flow at a kernel level. A different but related problem is when the priority of a running process is the cause of an X run. A process, or any number of processes, with a higher priority than an audio application will be allocated to system resources. So without a predictable, reliable access to CPU resources and devices like the sound card, the audio application will be susceptible to X runs. One way around this is to run your user space audio application with a higher priority than other processes, but in any case priority inversion can occur when a low priority thread holds on to a resource that your high priority task requires. For example, a low priority thread acquires a mutual exclusion lock on a resource your application uses. Next, a higher priority process preempts the first one and starts executing CPU bound code, but the first one still holds on to that mutex that we need. Uh, now the audio application running an even higher priority thread attempts to acquire a mutex that the first was holding and the first thread's been preempted by the second thread effectively taking its CPU sources to complete processing and blocking your audio application with the locked mutex. So a high priority is not a guarantee of reliable timely application of resources. And this problem isn't limited to mutexes. Any resource that can cause a task to block can be involved in a priority inversion situation example, communication packets, signals, and or events, file data and memory. To improve performance and reduce memory consumption, traditional Linux, and traditional Linux loads the corresponding pages into RAM only when they're needed. When a part of the address space is accessed, like a particular part of the code, it's not in RAM yet and a page fault is raised. This triggers the loading of the page in RAM and usually involves uh, a reading from a disk and possible unexpected latencies. In the default behaviour of standard kernels, interrupts, exceptions and system calls are never preempted. This means that they have a high priority in the CPU and are run before any task under the control of the scheduler. They can lock and block user space audio applications access to system resources. With timing, the traditional kernel timer is not accurate down to the millisecond, which makes response time unpredictable at low levels of latency required for audio production tasks. And over time, many of these developments that come from the real-time patches have gone into the mainline kernel. So um, these settings can be accessed mostly through your desktop if that's all you require. But if you need to do uh, live recording or performance using the desktop, then uh, you need to have the real-time patches. Look at that. I think we might be working. Now we can look at the changes to the uh, Linux system that characterise the config preempt real-time patches. Number one is in the scheduler. The first characteristic is a deterministic predictable scheduler. The schedule runs more often and events such as kernel codes and IRQs that used to be prioritised over the scheduler runs were brought under the scheduler's control 
Under the config preempt real-time kernel, there's also finer control over the schedule of classes that can be chosen for your applications and processes. Critical kernel code that used to be protected by locks are made preemptible by replacing them with real-time mutexes with priority inheritance. This means that um, priority inheritance is implemented for spin locks and semaphores. The process that locks a particular resource is temporarily raised to a highest priority of all tasks waiting for that lock, and a process which attempts to acquire a contended spin lock will no longer spin, but instead goes to sleep and waits for the lock to become free. Look at that, Linux in work. We might finish up a bit early, but uh, we can use that laptop in the next presentation for the example, which would be much more interesting. Um, all right, so I'll move up a layer now and talk about the sound systems, uh, basically about OSS, ALSA, Pulse Audio, Jack, G Stream, and most of which you probably know about. But um, during the late 80s and 90s, the sound on personal computers was revolutionised by the Creative Sound Blaster PCI card. <coughs> Um, the industry standard for multimedia and gaming applications was set from that level from then on. The original driver for the hardware on Linux to form the open sound system. OSS was the default on many other Unixes and supported many common sound devices at the time. Uh, its driver was designed around typical best practice Unix calls, so open, close, read, write, I control, select, MMAP. But by the late 90s, the limitations of this design for new audio features and hardware was becoming a problem. ALSA was created to provide state-of-the-art support for audio, and the Libay sound library and drivers represent a set of functions to configure hardware and software parameters and supported a variety of application design models. ALSA offered a support for USB and Bluetooth audio devices, support for AC97 cards, and HD audio dial-up soft modems such as the SI3055, which are fairly common at the time, but you don't really see them anymore. Interestingly enough, this has the AC97 driver still on it because it's a dirty old laptop. Um, okay, so OSS version 3 was the original sound system for Linux and it got dropped in 2002 when version 4 became proprietary software. Version 4 was then released again in 2007 when Forefront Technologies um, released its source code and provided it under the GPL license. OSS is still widely used and does have some advantages. It's a very small library, it's cross-platform and it's well documented. It's fast to start and it's got high quality sound, uh, but because it uses those low level I/O controls for direct kernel interfacing, it makes it difficult to use with sound servers like Pulse Audio and user space drivers such as Bluetooth and FireWire. Uh, in the early 2000s, Jack is implemented as a spin-off from Arda's audio engine. Arda is one of the applications I'll look at later on as a digitally or digital audio workstation. Um, and Jack is what really kind of brings most of the audio work on Linux together. So we'll go over that a fair bit. Uh, all right, so in the mid-2000s, work begins on Pulse Audio. KDE stops using ARTS as a sound server. GStreamer emerges, and desktop providers start providing their own libraries to go with their desktops, such as Phonon and LibSydney. And um, it, it just makes a complicated landscape for audio production because you've got a whole bunch of different libraries, a whole bunch of different servers. There is main ones that you can choose, but there's also a lot of options out there that make things a little bit more difficult for you. But while I've got five minutes to go, I'm going to get this up because it took me some time to do it. And it's fine. Thank you, Open Office. 
So this is some example of some audio applications that are available under Linux. Uh, that's a audio meter, a VU meter. Anyway, have a look at them all you're going. Um, okay, so we got up to talking about Pulse Audio uh, being a sound server for POSIX and Win32 systems. It's got better network support in terms of streaming and uh, consists of a library and a server daemon, which most of the sound servers are. Uh, it can be used by eSound, Alsa, OSS and GStreamer applications. It's got good low latency and latency measurement tools. And uh, it's the default sound server on Fedora since version 8 and Ubuntu since 8.04. And it's often chosen as a sound server for embedded systems. Uh, GStreamer is a cross-platform framework for building multimedia applications. We saw a lot of that this morning. Um, it's got a very small core library and as they said this morning, it's used in things like Rhythmbox, Totem, Caffeine and Amrock. So that's pretty well it for me. Uh, there's a lot I haven't covered. I didn't talk about hardware options for audio input like Firewire and USB and MIDI. Um, I didn't talk, talk about output with speakers and 3D and surround sound. Uh, we skipped entirely over mixing and MIDI's influence on the development of hardware and sampling rates and codecs we also didn't get into and we didn't look at sound creation on any other uh, PC type device like Windows or Mac or stuff like that. Um, but what I really wanted to try and focus on was the benefits of the real-time platform for the low latency work and the reasons why it was required. Uh, okay, so to apply the real-time patches to the Linux system, it's not a particularly difficult job and it's well documented, but it's possibly daunting if um, you haven't uh, patched your kernel before or you're using your system for another main use and you don't want to put real-time patches into it. So lots of the uh, vendors give out live CDs where you can test the platform uh, just using the DVD drive, which works pretty well, and there's a whole bunch of ready-built platforms out there like Studio 64, Ubuntu Studio, Planet, CRMA, Pro Audio, Jack Lab Musics, which is what I've got here, and um, uh, allow you to test the real-time features of the software without doing a rebuild of your existing system. So I would recommend having a look at some of them. I found some of them to be more stable than others. Uh, some of them work a lot better on a low-spec laptop like mine. Um, but I suppose what really makes these distributions outstanding is uh, the wealth of so software which runs on top of it, which you would have seen all the way through my talk if I'd got this running. But uh, we'll look at some of them later on. and That's about it for me. Thanks. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Mm -hmm.